What is it like to cover a war as a journalist, as a photojournalist? What is it like to be a photographer on the ground in Kiev right now? Erin Treb is with us and will tell us her experience from uh, on the ground in Kiev. Erin is a photojournalist and filmmaker currently in Kiev taking photos for various publications. She is a contributor to National Geographic, The New York Times, The Smithsonian Magazine, and many more. Erin, thank you so much for your work and for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So first of all, I just want to ask, where are you and how are you? I'm fine. I'm I'm tired, but I'm hanging in there. Um, long days uh, lately, and um, currently I'm I'm just in my hotel room. I finished work and um, filed my pictures, and I'm going to go to bed as soon as we <laughs> finish talking. I'm curious. As we're speaking, there's this convoy of Russian army vehicles headed toward Kiev. They seem stalled at the moment, but that must create an ongoing source of stress. Do you feel that? What does the city feel like right now? I've covered a variety of conflict, I guess you could say. And this is the first one I've covered where you can't actually see the conflict from inside Kiev. I think it's because the Russian forces are moving towards the city and you know, journalists, as they try to push outwards, a lot of times we're stopped by police or military who, you know, either um, fear for our safety, or perhaps they don't want us photographing um, where they are because they think it's a strategic point and they don't want to reveal that information. Um, so yeah, it's it's really bizarre because we see more of the military presence on the news than we actually do in person. And that's a really odd juxtaposition to be in the war and yet not see any fighting going on. Let's talk about some of the photographs. I'm finding them, your photos on Instagram, and um, they've helped give me a window into what it's like for people who are there on the ground, like sort of Ukrainians whose lives suddenly changed. I'd love to start with this image of a Ukrainian, looks like a very young man in army fatigues, I'm taking it, holding a gun. What are we looking at there? So these are members of the territorial defense units, and they're basically civilian militias, for lack of a better word, that have popped up in Ukraine to defend Ukraine, given the fact that the Ukrainian military is a lot smaller than the Russian military. They need more people. So these are civilians who have volunteered to to fight, to take up arms, and some of them have never held a weapon before. I've never held a gun before. This specific guy that's featured in the photo, I didn't talk to him. I talked to one of his buddies, but he was quite young. You know, a lot of these people coming to volunteer are just have normal, regular jobs. They're normal, regular people with no military experience. And where are we in this photograph? There are these interesting paintings on the wall. It looks like a library or a back room of some I don't know. What is this? It was a kind of an office building we wandered into. I can't give you the exact location um, for security reasons, but we saw a lot of territorial defense military hanging around. And so we kind of poked our heads in, which is how we find a lot of our subjects to photograph and um, introduced ourselves and met one of the um, sort of senior leaders of of the unit and he brought us into this room where all of these um, newly signed up volunteers were being registered and being given their weapons and um, you know some light training. What you said is so interesting because I know just from my conversations with the audience they are so skeptical of everything and think things are staged and set up and organized and You've explained when you're a war photographer, it's it's moments. You happen on something and, and you ask for entree. And I'm curious, when you say we show up, how many people do you travel with? And does someone speak Ukrainian? Does someone speak Russian? Yeah, for the first couple of days, I was photographing by myself. And because the situation has gotten more dangerous and more intense, um, you know, I personally feel better if I have some colleagues near me in case something happens, in case someone gets injured. Um, you know, it's not great to travel in groups that are too, too big, but, you know, two to three journalists, I think normally we kind of travel in clusters. One of the my colleagues is Ukrainian and does speak Ukrainian. Yes. And that's really helpful. In the next photo, I wanted to ask 
about uh, there's a young woman who's in a crush of people. They look like they're waiting for departure. What's happening here? So this is the central train station in Kiev. And every day that I've been here um, since the invasion started, there's been hundreds, if not thousands of citizens trying to evacuate, trying to flee and either go to cities, other cities where they have relatives or make it to the border of Poland. And so this was just a normal day at the train station, people clamoring to get on the train. It's really moving because the amount of stress and the stress levels have really escalated, especially in the past few days. People are really desperate to leave and get out and find safety. And so to watch people not be allowed to get on the trains or they're, you know, they, the Ukrainians actually haven't, there's not been a ton of widespread panic or pushing um, like you would imagine. They've been very civil about the whole thing, but, you know, they, there are a lot of tears at the train station, either they have to depart from a loved one or they have to, you know, leave their family behind. And so it's an emotional place um, to, to take pictures. I'm curious, is there a system or process for who gets to leave and who doesn't, or is it just first come first serve with a ticket? That's a good question. Um, as far as I, oh, sorry, it's okay. That one was close. Whoa. Yeah, I'm o- I'm okay. Is that shelling? <laughs> yeah. Um. That one was that one was closer than they normally are. I just need to keep a keep an eye on that window right there. <laughs> okay. What will you do if you think it's too close? Just let me know. Um, I go to the basement. Go, yeah, I'll go to the basement. Um, okay. yeah. Okay. Don't let us keep you. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. If it's too close, I'll let you know and I'll head down. Can I just ask, are you scared? Um, there's moments of, of fear. Um, you know, it's, it's weird to say, I wouldn't say I'm I'm used to it. Um, I have been in situations that are pretty precarious where explosions have happened in close proximity. Um, I think it's just kind of a part of the job. Like, you know, this is what I signed up for. I, I wanted to be a photojournalist since I was 19 and specifically a conflict and war photographer. So, um, you know, I, I, I can't necessarily say I knew what I was getting into, but <laughs> It's just a part of my life now. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah. Well, it's awesome what you do. Uh, and can I just ask, you're from Texas. Was there somebody you admired who was a war correspondent or photojournalist that made you decide at 19 you wanted to do this? Yes. Um, when I was a photo student at Texas A&M Commerce University, the war in Iraq had just started. It was around 2003. And I remember looking in the New York Times and seeing the photos of people who are now my colleagues like Ashley Gilbertson and Kate Brooks and Stephanie Sinclair and Lindsay Adario, who is actually here right now. Um, and just thinking like, that's what I want to do. I, 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 I've just known it, you know, since I was a, a teenager basically and felt a calling to it. And for me, it's, it's really mission driven work. Um, for me, the, the, I get a lot of gratification in talking to people, spending time with people and hearing their stories, and then knowing that those stories can get out to the world so that people, you know, I'm basically a communicator. If I can tell that story in a way that brings dignity to the people who are in my photographs and helps people on the other side of the planet understand what they're going through, I mean, to me, that's, that's a huge gift, and that's what I'm passionate about. It is. It's beautiful, and you do it so well. Oh, thank you. Have there been bombardments of Kiev while you've been there? Yes. Um, every day there's some type of shelling. Um, normally they are further out on the outskirts. We did receive warning last night that the Russian military would begin targeting um, government buildings. And I'm about a kilometer and a half from Maidan and from Independence Square where there are, oops, sorry, where there are government buildings. Um, so there could be, the shelling could, um, intensify, uh, this evening, um, near where I'm staying, but we think it'll be kind of further off towards the center. Are you prepared to move or you don't think you have to yet? 
Um, we we do have an evac plan and um, a shelter in place plan for sure. My my, you know, something that's really important that I don't necessarily think was it wasn't something that we practiced and drilled. Um, you know, I ten years ago, and I think the photojournalism and journalism community has become much more fastidious in preparing. Like we all carry med kits, we all carry Kevlar vests with plates, we carry helmets, and these are really essential tools to where we can, you know, make sure that we're safe, we're not a liability to each other, and that we're doing our job in the in the best and safest way possible. Because we can't, you know, we can't tell stories if we get injured or right. killed. Like it's a job's job's over, you know. Well, it's so important right now too, because there's so much misinformation and confusing information. And when there's a credible tested person like you getting information out. We know it's reliable. And so your work is so incredibly important. I can't emphasize that enough to you. I hope you know it. We are constantly on watch for disinformation and warned not to believe what we're looking at. And so when we have something from you and we know it's real, that's game change. So just want you to know we we see that. Thank you. And, you know, to viewers who may not understand necessarily the principles or ethics of photojournalism, we are, you know, our ethical standard is that we're not allowed to move anything in the photograph. We're not allowed to tell someone even to tilt their head slightly to the right. You know, we, we don't interfere. We try to be uh, good journalists, at least try to be flies, you know, a fly on the wall. And that's our job is to interfere as the least amount possible. So, you know, any people ask me, you know, did you stage that or did and I'm like, yeah, I it definitely you know, we don't stage things. Um, I don't stage things. I can't speak for everyone, but none of my colleagues do. Um, we try to create the most authentic um, representation possible. Let's go back to the photos. And I want to be respectful of your times so that we don't go over, but in our remaining minutes, let's just talk about these photos again. So at the train station, you were saying you don't believe there's any sort of system or order for who gets out first. It's a, you get a ticket, you go. I don't even think there are tickets at this point. Um, people basically just wait on the platform and wait at the station for hours, sometimes days, to for a train to show up, and then they try to get on it. That's my understanding of how it works. Ukrainians are being given preferential treatment, which is actually a problem. There's a lot of foreigners here either working or students who can't get out um, based on either their ethnicity or what country they're from. And they're stuck. And, you know, that's 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 a problem. Is that especially targeting black foreigners or it's foreigners from many co- countries? I think it's I mean, it, the foreigners the that I saw were from India, Pakistan, Asia and Africa. So they are people of color um, and not Ukrainian. I see. So it's Africans and people from many countries. Um, that's helpful yeah. to know because that's getting a lot of coverage with confusion here. Are they being um, held back at the train station? Yes. Um, they're see. either, you know, they'll be on the platform or in the queue to get on the train and they'll kind of be held back, you know, um, just told, no, you can't get on. Like, you know, you have to stand to the side and then, yeah. And we're seeing a lot of videos of um, families separating, which you mentioned, where the man stays back to fight and the women leave. Is that sort of what you're seeing in the city? Is it now a city of men or is that sort of misleading? No, there are. I mean, there definitely are still a lot of women here. Um, it, it's it's that that is true that men between the ages of 18 and 60 are required by martial law to stay in case they are called upon to fight. I don't know. I haven't really noticed that there's more men than women. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, there's still there's still plenty of women in Kiev that I see walking around and are women staying to fight? I have actually not met any female fighters yet. I would love to. I know that they're out there. Mm-hmm. Um, at all of the um, territorial defense posts that I've been to, it's it's all men. Are there children still in the city? Do you see young kids? There are, yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, today I went to a shelter that's um, underneath a metro station. It was something like five or six stories down um, underground. And there were tons of kids down there sheltering with their families. And what's it like in those spaces? It's crowded, um, a little hot. Um, the But, you know, people, 
have, I, I would say, are in decent spirits. You know, a lot of the people that I met in the sheltering in the metro station had their pets and their cats and dogs and were watching movies and, you know, on their phones and were actually, you know, in, I would say, a decent, you know, decent spirits given the situation. Is there food provided to them and water? There is, yes. They have, um, they can bring their own food and supplies. And then also the military, I talked to one woman who said that the military was bringing food down and distributing it. But they can't get Wi-Fi, I imagine. So they must be starved for information. I don't know. You know, I had a cell phone reception down there, so I don't know. Wow. I don't know how, if they do or not, but um, I definitely saw like kids playing video games and stuff so that they at least have some form of entertainment on, okay. on their device. Yeah. Let's talk about the third photo I wanted to bring up, which is this, it's eerily beautiful image of a destroyed building w- with a man in front on the phone. What What are we looking at here? That was a building that was destroyed um, about four or five days ago, and it was an apartment complex that was hit with some form of, of Russian missile or rocket. Luckily, most of the residents of the building, my understanding is that most of the residents had evacuated beforehand or were sheltering in place underneath the building. And so there were not many casualties. But yeah, I mean, a a huge rocket hit and took out a massive chunk of the side of this apartment building. And it really, you know, is proof that the Russian military is targeting um, civilian infrastructure, which they've said repeatedly that they are not. But this right here is a picture that proves otherwise. How long do you plan to stay? I'd like to stay for as long as the story is happening, honestly. Um, you know, I feel um, this is my first time in Ukraine. I'm, I have a lot more experience working in the Arab world and in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I still feel tied to this story um, because it's a situation where people are suffering. And um, I have, you know, I feel like in a way, it's I hate to say it's kind of my specialty, but I am that's what I do is human interest stories. And I go after kind of the hard, grittier stories. So I don't want to leave if, if I can help it. Um, and, you know, of course the story continues. It doesn't end. Even if the Russians stop, you know, there's still 600,000 refugees who have crossed the border. Um, people's lives have changed and they'll continue to change. So um, yeah, as long as I can um, stay and um, it's safe, ish. And I can keep making stories that are hopefully making a difference. I, I'd like to keep going. Well, Aaron, I could talk to you forever, but I want you to be able to get some sleep because you say you have an early day and it'll be a big day tomorrow. So mm-hmm. is there anything you'd like an audience that's watching this to know? Yeah, I think, you know, I think people, when they hear reports, they tend to get overwhelmed and feel that the problem is so massive. What can I do? I'm just one person, you know, I can't make a difference. And that's absolutely not true. There's tons of NGOs and organizations out there that are doing amazing work for Ukrainians, for refugees, for um, mothers, for babies, you know, all different types of people with different needs. And um, I posted some to my Instagram the other day, um, some links where you could click and go straight to the donation page. And I can't emphasize enough how much even, you know, I hate to sound like an infomercial, but even $25 can help, <laughs> you know, bring someone a hot meal or blankets. And so, you know, I, I just want to encourage audiences to not feel overwhelmed and despondent, you know, and like they can't make a difference because they absolutely can. Well, we are so glad that there is somebody with your combination of caring and concern and badassery and artistic talent there on the ground. So thank you you. for your work, for your time. Can we please stay in touch? I'd love to get more of your work out to this audience. I love that. Thank you so much, Jessica.